ask, what does this mean? If I say things in this next couple of days that you don't understand what I mean, I have failed. You haven't failed, I've failed. I'm supposed to make things clear to you. So I don't mind, and I'm sure the, uh, nobody will mind if you stop things right in the tracks there and say, what does it mean? I remember we were in, uh, in Switzerland a couple of years back at a YWAM uh, school and there's a young Israeli woman there. I discovered later she was taking, listening to lectures in English, taking down the notes in Hebrew. But every now and then she put her hand up and say, you're using two fancy words. What does that mean? That was great. I just think, what do I really mean? Second question is even more important. How do you do it? How do you do it? Because again, in the church, we're accustomed to spread out the great ideals as to what Christians should become. <coughs> we're pretty short on the ground at telling them how to do it. So again, if I, uh, if I say things today without giving you at least some clues as to how to begin to do it, I have failed, and I don't want to fail. We're going to be talking about leadership, and I want you to see, to begin with, we're covering a very specialized area of skill. Because leadership is often confused, particularly in the church, with two other things that are quite different. One of them is management. Management is not leadership. <clears throat> Most of the leadership seminars I've been at or read about actually don't teach leadership at all. They teach management techniques. Now, management techniques are necessary. Management is the stewardship of resources, if you like. Very few leaders are good managers. They have to get managers to do that job for them. But don't think by learning management techniques that will make you become a good leader. Quite different capacities, okay? The second thing in the church is we often confuse leadership with ministry. So if you want to choose a leader for a church organization, you find somebody with an outstanding ministry. And sometimes you find a leader who has failed and doesn't know why he's failed. He's got a very good ministry, gives his ministry all he's got. The only thing he's failed to do is to give what he's supposed to give, and that is leadership. So we're talking in, uh, I'm not saying that leadership is more important than management, more important than ministry, but I'm saying as far as our seminar is concerned, we're not talking about either of these, we're talking about this business of leadership. I remember coming through the airport in Los Angeles a couple of years ago, a bit more than that, picking a newspaper off the book stand, uh, a report of a conference on the many aspects of leadership. And after three days, the conference came to the conclusion that America as a society was overmanaged and underled. Overmanaged and underled. I think what is true of America is true probably of all our Western uh, societies as well. Probably it's, a, probably it's a worldwide phenomenon. But underlines the fact that before we, we go any further, we need to understand what leadership is. Okay? Right, here's the first thing. Leadership has to do with goals and direction. In other words, if you are a leader, the first question I'd want to know from you is, where are you heading? If we're just responding to situations as they come up, crisis management, we're not leading at all, actually. Circumstances are leading. They're, they're determining where we're going to. So leadership has to do with goals and directions. Therefore, it is essentially future-oriented. If you look at the general level of management in business <clears throat> and look at the, the time, uh, the proportion of a manager's time spent on planning, that is to do with the future, you find something like this. First level management would spend, a first level supervisor would spend probably only about 5% of his time on planning, thinking about the future. Second level, middle management, <clears throat> would spend about 10%. Operating managers would spend at least 25%. When you get to top management, the CEO ought to spend 50% or more of his time with his hands behind his head, his feet on his desk, thinking about what? About the future, where, where, where things are going to. 
So management, uh, leadership rather is essentially future oriented. The leader is concerned about what's not here yet. I believe that many of these capacities we're talking about uh, at this stage are innate. Because being future oriented, this whole thing here has to do with vision. And to be a leader, you need to some extent to be a visionary. Now as you'll see as we go on, to be a visionary is a necessary qualification for leadership, but it is not a sufficient qualification for leadership. See. Leaders have to be, in some sense, a visionary, but being a visionary does not necessarily make you a leader. That's what I'm trying to say. But the leader has to be concerned about this whole business of what's going to happen next month, next year, five years' time, ten years' time, and so on. A lot of your attention has to be in the future. And a person who doesn't have the capacity to function that way, that's too vague. I think, well, the future is unknown. What can you do with the future? You don't know what's going to be like in the future. See? Now, the capacity that the leader has to handle the future is a thing called foresight. And you could put it this way. If you're a leader, that means you have a lead over other people. What is the nature of your lead? The lead that the leader has is he's supposed to be better at pointing direction to the future. See? To be better at, at anticipating what's likely to happen in the future. Better than other people at making sense of the future. That's his essential capacity. And if he's not doing that, he's not really leading. Let me just show, show you something before we go on. <clears throat> there are actually four areas with which leaders have to be concerned in an organization. And they have to give adequate input into each, all four of these areas. The first area is the question of task or mission. That is, what is the organization to do, where are they going, what are their objectives? So the leader's job is to clarify the objectives, to anticipate possibilities and opportunities in the future, and so on. He's concerned with the mission of the organization. Secondly, he's con concerned with the group. That is, with coordinating the resources that are in the group, with handling conflict within the group, with building group dynamics, relationships within the group. This is the best indicator of morale, one way or other, in an organization, the state of relationships within the, within the organization. So leaders have to be concerned with the group. Thirdly, they have to be concerned with the individual. because groups are made up of individuals. And the task of the leader is to help the individual to discover the potential that God has placed in his life, to give him or her opportunities to achieve that potential, and to steward him so that the things that stand in the way of him reaching that potential are dealt with. So as leaders, you have to be concerned with the individual. Fourthly, there's an area in here which is actually the corporate spirit of the organization. It's culture, if you like. It's personality. The heart of the, th of the, of the organization. And that needs to be tended and nourished. We're going to spend some time on that in one of the later sessions. But this is the point I want to make. If there is imbalance about input into these areas, you're going to strike problems. For example, you get some organizations, some churches for that matter, that are highly task-oriented. The leadership is totally task-oriented. And there is a, a drive, there is a push, there is an energy there to fulfill a task all the time. The group is neglected. What you have happening here is generally a, a power struggle for positions of power. 
You find conflict arising in the group and the very task-oriented leader gets impatient with that. He can't uh, be bothered with all that squabbling and so on going on inside the group. Why don't you get your act together and let's get on with what we're supposed to be doing? Uh, so the group lacks the resilience or the resources to handle difficult times when they come up. The thing's quite fragile. Thirdly, individuals get scarred and broken and hurt along the way because they miss out on opportunities, their needs not attended to, and they drop off. And eventually the whole spirit of the organization can collapse. On the other hand, you have some organizations where all the emphasis seems to be placed on the group. If it's a church, you find a lot of emphasis on, on fellowship, on group relationships, on caring, and so on, and a very uh, warm uh, dynamic builds up there. It, it can become the characteristic holy huddle. Everybody's having a marvelous time, but they're not going anywhere. Nothing to be, nothing to be accomplished. Yet. What's more, the more effective that uh, group thing becomes, the more it seals itself off from people who try to get in. It's like being sometimes in a in a family dinner in a very close knit family, and halfway through the meal, you discover they're laughing at jokes you don't understand. There's a dynamic going on there that you don't, you can see it happening, but you don't know how to get into it. Have you ever been in a place like that? And our very success in a church, even in building fellowship relationships, caring relationships, if you're not careful, can seal yourself off from people outside. Not that you hold them off, but there's something there that somehow they can't break through to get in. At the same time, very often the task has been lost, uh, lost sight of. And so boredom sets in, people who are, who are, are uh, oriented towards an objective, they get fed up with that, they go somewhere else. Individuals who can't fit into the group feel isolated and they drop off, and again, the spirit of the organization can suffer. On the other hand, you get some places where all the attention is placed on the individual. If it's a church, it's very much into healing, into deliverance, and into wholeness and so on, getting wounded, broken people, bandaging them up and so on, it becomes virtually a hospital. Uh, there's no objective, no, no direction, no goal. Uh, the group is being drained by uh, tending the, the needs of broken individuals, and again, the whole thing can, can uh, ultimately collapse. Now, if you look at the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus paid adequate attention to all four of those areas. He was a brilliant leader. Always talking about the task. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. What happens when you come to Jesus? He sends them out two by two. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A lot of emphasis on mission and task in Jesus' ministry. At the same time, he spent a lot of time teaching group dynamics. Amongst the Gentiles, there are great ones lorded over them, not so among you. If I wash your feet, I've left you an example that you should do so the same to one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Teaching them how to live with each other in the family of God. At the same time, Jesus spends time with the individual, sorting out Peter's problem, sorting out Thomas's problem, Andrew, Philip, James, John, woman of Samaria. A lot of time the Son of God spent with individuals in perfect balance. At the same time, he addresses uh, the spirit of the organization. Read the letters to the seven churches in uh, the book of Revelation. He's writing there not to the, to the angel of the church, not an angelic being, because he says, unless you repent, I'll remove your candlestick. He's writing to the inner spiritual pole of life of the organization. And as leaders, we need to attend to all four of those areas. That's why I personally am totally committed to team leadership. Because apart from the Son of God, I can't see how it's possible for one man to give adequate uh, input into all four of those areas. Now, in a team, one member may be drawn towards one or other of those areas more than the, the, the others, but there's an opportunity to see that all four of those are attended to. And as far as leadership is concerned, in the, as an ongoing function, we need to care for all four of those areas. Now, specifically in terms of foresight, we're talking about the task. And I want you to see the implications that are involved in this capacity called foresight. The first is this. The leader in dealing with the future 
is operating with a wider than normal span of awareness. I'll explain what I mean. The leader has to operate with a wider than normal span of awareness. That is to say, when you're considering the future, you have to take into account not just hard data. You need to take into account hard data. You need hard data. But there's more there to make up the picture. In other words, you're dealing with things like opinions, uh, things like uh, impressions, hints, things like intuitions, very insubstantial stuff. But all that helps to make part of the total picture if you're going to make sense about, uh, about what's going to happen. And if you look at a leader who is good at his job and you examine the way he operates, you'll discover that's what's actually happening. He takes into account things that other people wouldn't, wouldn't uh, consider at all. He's got hunches. He, he has a kind of an uh, intuitive feeling. Uh, he, he's got imagination, as, as Dan was mentioning. All that is part of the picture. Now, I'm not saying that all of those carry equal weight, but what I am saying is they all have their place, and we need to operate so that all of them uh, are received and, and uh, provide part of the input uh, we need uh, to, to make sense of the future. Secondly, the leader is not only allowing all that stuff to have its place, he generally has a sense for what is relevant and what is not. And again, that's a very, very important capacity. If you get somebody who does not have a genuine foresight and say, we're concerned about a five-year plan, get together the information we need and so on and give me some, uh, some options. A person like that will, will gather uh, data till the cows come, like a magpie. I mean, piles of the stuff. They don't really know what to do with it, but they get all sorts of data, see. Then you need somebody who can leaf through all that kind of stuff and say, what's well, interesting, but not important, we don't need to bother about that. Yeah, that's, that now, we have, to, we have to pay attention to that. That's important, see. Now, nobody could really tell you where that sense for relevance comes from. I, I think it's partly an intuitive thing, but it's necessary to know from all the stuff that's there uh, what, what inner weight you can, you can, you can uh, place on it. And something that seems quite insubstantial, just a kind of uh, passing comment, uh, suddenly you says that's significant, you know, that, that, that's important. You couldn't explain why you know it's important, but you know. Whereas all those detailed estimates, well, they're interesting, but you don't need to bother about that kind of thing. You understand what I mean? A sense of what's relevant and what's not. It's the second thing. The third thing is the capacity, amongst all that stuff, to see patterns, to see relationships, to see the way the, the bits of apparently disparate and discrete information could be fitted together. Sometimes to turn the whole thing upside down and, uh, and, and look at things from a totally different point of view. But a person looking at all that all stuff, the, uh, all that information, relationships, patterns, order begins to emerge. Okay? Fourthly, in gathering all that stuff together, there is a need to exercise what you could call creative thinking. That is to generate ideas and possibilities that might make sense of the information of the data. Sometimes that can come out of uh, brainstorming. Sometimes that can come out of uh, uh, jotting down material and assessing possibilities. But there's something creative there that either a person has or, the, or they haven't. I think sometimes the person who is an entrepreneur, I mean, at the time he's made his first half million, I think, why didn't I see that opportunity? Why well, didn't see that opportunity? Because I'm not an entrepreneur, see. But the entrepreneur does. He sees a bare patch of land, he's got a kind of idea one day, you know, they might put a whole housing development on that, and there's a block there that might make a good business site, and long before anybody has any idea what's going to happen, he's bought that business site, see. What happens five years down the track, ten years down, suddenly there's a, a development there, see. Now, he didn't know about it, see, but he saw something, an imaginative uh, journey into the future to sense the possibilities that, that, is, that are there, and, and, and bring those into being. See. 
that, that creative insight. There is a moment in, in all of that process that again is difficult to describe, but is important for us to try and grasp. And what, I'm, what I mean by it is this, that when you are dealing with uh, all those possibilities and all that data and uh, all the variables that, that come along, there's a stage when you need to step back inside yourself from all your pondering, all your thinking, all your estimating, and wait. Wait for inspiration to develop. I find a very vivid example of that actually in, in the eighth chapter of John's Gospel. In fact, there's a lot of lessons, I think, for it in, in that uh, passage. It's the story of the time when they brought to Jesus the woman taken in adultery. And you're familiar with uh, the incident. They, they got Jesus uh, in a catch-22 situation, they thought. Uh, they brought the woman to Jesus and said, Moses said we ought to stone somebody like that. What do you say? Now, they had Jesus both ways, you see. If he said, uh, no, don't stone her, forgive her, he'd, he'd lose his reputation as an upholder of the law of Moses. See? If he said, well, that's the law, I'm sorry, you to keep the law of God, that's what the law says, stone her, then he'd lost his reputation as a saviour, as a redeemer, as a, as a friend of sinners. And the story says that Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. I've heard lots of sermons preached about what Jesus wrote on the ground in that instant. Sometimes I wonder whether he was really writing a little question, and Father, can I please throw one stone at the Pharisees? Uh, what I think was happening was this. Jesus was assessing all the possibilities. All the possibilities of, of the Mosaic law, of rabbinical commentary on the law, he, he knew the lot. He was assessing the effect any decision might have on the people who were around him, on the Pharisees for that matter, on the woman for that matter, on the other people who were on his disciples, all the possibilities, the possibilities of all the options that were in front of him, the way it would affect us here and now because you were going to be recorded. He, he surveys all those and then he steps back inside himself and waits. Now, when I, when I think about it, the character that's involved is that. Can you imagine the situation? Everybody, hang, hang on a word. The time running is a tick, tick, tick of the clock, and, and the people waiting and the disciples kind of smitten. God, he's going to fail. You know, he's going to blow this one. And Jesus waits. He just waits. He waits. And then the word comes. See, that him that is without sin cast the first stone. Now, I believe in the whole area of vision, in the whole area of catching hold of what's in the future, there are times when uh, leadership has to do that. See. When you know you've got all sorts of possibilities, all sorts of ideas, that don't make all that much sense, and somehow out of that jumble, something's going to arise, and you just have to wait. See. And it can be a real character test because it can be at a time when everybody's pushing for a decision. When circumstances are pushing for a decision, and you know you haven't got one, you haven't got any idea yet, you just got to wait. See. Now, it's at that time that the really genuine creative visions are likely to arise. And it is at that time where we can have access to divine wisdom. And divine wisdom sometimes is so superior to human wisdom that in human terms you can't make any sense about it at all. But I don't believe we'll get divine wisdom unless we do our bit to apply human wisdom. Uh, God will never give us revelation to save us perspiration, see, to save us doing our, doing our bit. But out of the struggle of all that, there are times wonderfully in God's intervention where, where, where something emerges that's beyond our capacity ever to imagine. See. We're tapping into, into divine wisdom. If you look at the way the Hebrew prophets function, it may, may help you to get a handle on this. The Hebrew prophets, part of their role, it seems, was to give a, a political advice to the kings of Israel. And they operated with information from at least three sources. Firstly, their acute, informed perceptions about what was going on around them. 
In fact, they were, they were if you like, they were, they were analyzing the circumstances. And leaders have to function in this whole area of foresight as an analyst. You've got the data, you've got the implications, you can take the whole thing to bits, you need to know all the bits and pieces, so analyze it thoroughly. Secondly, the prophets had access to the sacred writings. In other words, they knew the history of God's dealings with Israel, they knew what God's character was like, knew how God responded to various situations, and had, they had that information to apply to what their analysis told them. In other words, they were functioning as a historian. And leaders, when they're dealing with the future, are also concerned with the past. See? You're bringing part of the input you're bringing to bear on your, on your prospecting in the future is your past experience. The, the, the failures of the past, some of the uh, successes of the past, the precedents of the past, you have, to, uh, you have to act as a historian. But thirdly, they were standing in the councils of God to receive God's immediate revelatory word. They're acting as seers, if you like. They were seers because they could see things that other people couldn't see. They were seeing really the future that was latent in the present. Not just the unknown, unimaginable future, not just prediction. They were seeing the future that was really potential or latent in the present circumstances. So the prophet comes into, into a situation where everything seems to be going well, things are fine, but he sees something. He sees a flaw in people's motivation. He sees, he sees something wrong with their hearts. And he says, if you go on the way you're going, it looks all right now, but in three years' time, ten years' time, you're going to come under judgment, see. Repent, change your way, see. Or it comes into another situation where things seem to be going to the wall, really difficult circumstances. But he sees there's something in people's hearts that's right. He says, don't lose heart, keep on the way you're going, you're going to come out into restoration, and God's going to bless you down the tracks. He's seeing the future that is latent in the present. And foresight has to do with that, that also. So the times when the, when the leader has to function in all three of those roles, okay? And the aim out of all this is to come up with a better than average prediction about what's going to happen in the future. Now at this stage, the whole thing may seem to be largely intu intuitive. I've been trying to break the thing down so we see the inner workings of the way in which foresight works. You can see this functioning, if you like, in the very good sportsmen, you know, the ones who operate at almost genius level. You know, the, 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 the footballer who, when the ball comes out unexpectedly in a totally uh, unexpected direction, is always there waiting for the pass that's going to enable him to score. Now, how does he know to be there? I think this kind of thing's happening. He's reading the plays, he's anticipating what's likely to happen, he knows the way the opposing team works, he knows past experience, what happens in a situation like that. He's got just an intuitive idea, out here, instead of the play seems to be going that way, but out here, it's going to come here. And most times he's right, see. Now foresight for a leader is something like that. Coming up with a better than average prediction about what's likely to happen in the future, and coalescing that or clarifying that into a goal, into an objective. See? Now, when, when, that, when this is happening, we have to distinguish between objectives and goals. Objectives are long-range, overarching directions in which we are moving. But objectives by themselves are not enough to get things underway. They're too vague. They're too broad, if you like. See? Objectives always have to be clarified into specific goals. Once I've got a specific goal, then I know whether I'm making progress or not. You can't know whether you're making progress towards an objective. It's too general. And, and oftentimes with leaders, they get their objectives right, particularly in the church. They have the objectives such as uh, 
enabling Christians to rise to maturity or something like that, or, or uh, reaching the, t the, the whole community with the gospel. Now, that's a great objective, but it's not enough to tell us whether we're making any progress. It needs to be clarified and, and concretized, if you like, into, into uh, specific goals. Then when we've got specific goals, I can monitor progress along the way and know whether in fact I'm achieving those goals or making any, direct, any headway towards fulfilling ob objectives. Okay. okay, now there's another important qualification that comes into, in at this stage in, in terms of goals. That's this. Leaders have to, discuss, have to uh, uh, envision, if you like, goals, but not any goal will do. What's more, not even any good goal will do. What's more, not even any good goal that excites the people, the leaders will do, unless it also somehow grips the people. Otherwise, the leaders are on their own. And if nobody's following you, you're not a leader. So there has to be a certain congruence, or if you like, resonance, between the goals of the leaders and the aspirations of the people. Very interesting passage in John chapter 10. You can learn a lot about leadership from John chapter 10, the Good Shepherd chapter. It says, when the shepherd leads forth his sheep, he goes before them. So the lead that the leader has is he's on in, in front of the people he's leading. He's going somewhere. Secondly, it says that the shepherd knows his own sheep by name. Now in the Bible, names always mean identity or character, never just title. What does that mean? It means the shepherd knows the characteristics of his sheep. And, and leaders need to know their people. Because you have to get not just any goals, you have to get the right goals that are right for the organization and goals that are right for the organization for that time, T. So it's not, it's not just the right goals for the organization, the right goals for the time. How do you know whether you've got goals that will resonate with the aspirations of your people? The answer is you need to know your people. You need to know your people. Now it's, it's important to understand this because the very task-oriented leader is impatient with that sort of thing. I mean, it's a waste of time. It's, it's just talking to people. What's the point of that? He, he's gripped by his vision. He's got his goals. He sells his goals and so on. And then he wonders why he's got to struggle to get people committed. He. Sometimes I've seen over the years this kind of thing happen in the church particularly. Along comes a very experienced, successful leader, a very charismatic personality, a very gifted person. He's got a brilliant goal, got a great mission, a great uh, project that's uh, exciting him. Beautifully presented, enthusiastically declared. Everybody admires it, uh, uh, commends him, promises to pray for him and so on. You know what? Nobody buys into it. See? And I've seen uh, leaders get really bitter over the years uh, over things like that. See? Where's the commitment of this bunch of people here? Worse still, once or twice I've seen on the heels of a guy like that, along comes a young half-baked leader with no track record to speak of. He's got a vision, he's only, only half clear about what it's like, and it's clumsily presented, but suddenly everybody wants to buy into it. <laughs> Why? Well, the first one's got leaders that have got a, a goal that doesn't, doesn't fit the people. The second one has somehow struck a goal that uh, carries a, a resonance with the, with, the, with the aspirations of people. I noticed this uh, in hindsight in our church at home. I discovered that uh, what I had been habitually doing when I was talking to people, <coughs> uh, even on pastoral visits, because actually I'm not a pastor, I, I'm a hopeless pastor. Crisis counseling is what pastoral visitation uh, doesn't interest me at all very much. It has to be done. It's very important work. I'm not saying that. But when I was talking to people, I'd always be dreaming out loud. 
always suggesting ideas, always running things past people. Now, most of them weren't serious intentions at all. Uh, a lot of them were, were really quite crazy, but uh, out of people's feedback, you see, you get responses from them. You can build up over a period a, a quite accurate, intuitive sense of where people are at. See. Now, good leaders, I discover, do this instinctively. You get a bunch of leaders together talking about projects, and one of them might say, well, that's all right for you guys, but where I come from, that will go down like a lead balloon. How does he know? He's never asked. He knows. He knows his people. Or he might say, well, that's, that, that, that's no good for us, not yet anyway, but six months' time we could look at that. How does he know? He's an ass. See. You've got a pretty good idea. See. Or he might say, that's for us. You know, I've been looking for something like that. Our people go, go bundle on that. I'm going to take that on as soon as I give it. How does he know? See? He's learned to know his people. Now, I mention this because it's very important that that kind of rapport, that kind of interchange of heart and desire and so on, uh, be built up between leaders and people, see. Because if you bring in front of them things that don't really interest them, they, they may try for your sake to be committed to it, but their heart won't be in it, see. So spend time with your people, uh, so they have a chance to share their ideas, their inspirations, their aspirations rather with you. Now there needs to be a very high level of trust between leaders and people for that to happen. See? Otherwise people will only tell you what they think you want you to hear. See? But if they know they can tell you their, their frank opinions and it will not be held against them, then you can build up a sufficient knowledge to guide you not only as to what the goal ought to be, but as to when to go public with it. See? So don't, don't, don't neglect, the question of resonance uh, is very, very important. Okay, there's another aspect that uh, is very important in terms of, uh, of goals, and that's, that's the question of timing. And again, what I'm going to talk about here is one of the capacities that, to me, separates between people who are leaders and people who are not leaders. People who are not leaders placed in a position where they have to exercise foresight flounder, really. I mean, they're, they're stressed because they really can't make sense of the uh, uncertain, vague future that leaders have to operate in. The question of timing, again, is something that's, that's uh, uh, either instinctively there in a person, or if it's not there, I don't think you can really produce it. Just let me show you this. Take this as being the timeline between the present and the future. Should actually flow the other way. Time flows back from the future to the present. Now the visionary operates solely in the future. He paints his castles in the sky, builds his uh, pictures and so on, dreams his dreams, and uh, he can tell you in great detail as to what the vision is. The only thing is don't tell him to do it. You have people like that, you know, they've got this great plan, this great idea, this great vision, and you start to get excited with it, and you say, fine, how about starting it off? That's when they back off, isn't it? The visionary operates solely in the future. The leader has to be a visionary, or have a vision, but he has to commit resources in the present that will catch the vision in the future and bring it back to the present. And that's what separates the person who has a potential for leadership and the one who hasn't. Because the one who hasn't, that's a high stress occupation place to be. See. They, they are really under pressure. See. How can you be sure? How do you know? What if? Now, can we? Should we? See. They, they, they lie awake at night bothering over all those, all those questions. And after they've made a decision, now they're in agony, so it's worth being the right decision or not. You see, the, the, the challenge that faces leaders, leaders is this, regarding the vision. When do we go for it? If we go too soon, then next week we might get more information that shows we've made a mistake. On the other hand, 
If we wait until we've got all the information we need, we know we're going to be too late. And there comes a point when the leaders, leadership has to do what I call jump the information gap. In other words, they have to decide now with less than perfect information to go for it. The person who is not a leader will either do one or two things. One is they'll dither here until it's, the opportunity is totally gone. Or they'll step out in presumption long before they've got adequate information to make that jump. See. In either way, they're highly stressed. This area here between the interface between the present and the future is what people who are leaders call the cutting edge. I mean, they, they love that, that risk. See. They know where the risk is, that's where the opportunity is. They live with that with great delight. They, they, they can function in that area. See. And they are willing to, to step out into the uncertain future. Listen, with the confidence that when they do, and when they face problems and questions in the future, that they don't know what they're going to be, they have the confidence inside themselves they'll be able to find the answer. Do you understand what I mean? That's jumping the information gap. Saying so we haven't got perfect information, we, but we've got to go now. Let's go for it, and I know we're going to face questions, I know we're going to pray for it, but we'll find the answer, see. Now, <clears throat> the person who is not a leader can't manage, or can really manage that. <clears throat> the person who is a leader is willing to take that risk. And he has the confidence inside himself, or inside herself, when we get into the future, and we face the problems, somewhere, somehow, we'll find what the answers are, okay? And <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the question of timing affects not only when that leap is to be taken, but also when the vision is to be released. Because again, if the vision is released too soon, if there is a premature disclosure to the people who are going to follow, you may get the wrong, the, the, the wrong response because they haven't got enough information. You may find you've asked them to buy into something that you're not really uh, sure of, of yourself. So the question as to when to, when to go public, the question of timing is critical. <coughs> I think you find, <coughs> you find the same issue arising very often in the church. when it comes to the role of the prophet. <coughs> You'll notice, for example, that when there's a prophecy, it generally has a kind of immediacy about it. I mean, the prophet comes with his message, and he's got a word from God, and if you don't move straight away or by Tuesday at the latest, the judgment of God has got to come upon him because God, he has spoken, see. Now, let's be, let's be fair. That is the only way the prophet can give the message. He does not have the luxury of inspecting it beforehand to discover whether he's got it right. He has to give it the way he gets it, see. But it's not the job of the prophet, it's the job of the elders to decide the when, see. So you find in John chapter 10, it says, when the shepherd leads forth his sheep, he goes before them. And leadership has to struggle all the time with the tension of the when. And there are times when the elders of the church have to receive the prophecy and to resist the, the pushing of the prophet who is, who is on, in agonies because he's declared the word of the Lord and nothing's happening about the word of the Lord. That's not his role. His role is to, to declare the vision. The elders is to decide the when. And in business terms, in any term, in place of leadership, that issue will, 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 will arise. And these are the critical ones that to me separate people who have the potential of becoming, they don't automatically make you a leader. But unless you have the potential to handle situations like these, I doubt whether a person can become an effective leader. Okay? Right.